Thank you so much for being here. This is an Omnis Academy webinar, and Christian is going to do the openings. Oh, we right. to, yeah, we're ready to start. Yeah. Yes. Sure. Yes. Right. So, uh, yes, welcome everyone, and uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, so, today we're going to be talking about uh, uh, these uh, incre incredible people that we have here joined around us today to talk about their experiences within in health and also biotechnology sort of uh, spaces uh, and looking at their experiences from their own particular angles and sort of trying to combine those stories and seeing where we can draw some value from each of them to help obviously our audience. I had the pleasure of spending a lot of time with all of, all of pretty much all of these women over the past weekend at the Health Optimization Summit. And it was uh, great to see them all in person again, you know, after a long time. But um, so I think what we'll do is we'll do some introductions of each, uh, of each individual person to, to hear a bit more about them from uh, their own mouths. And uh, then we can start diving into some questions to, um, you know, see what knowledge they can share with us today. Yes, and also remember, um, the users that um, chat is open. So if you want to drop a question for any of our guests, feel, please feel free and we'll have a QA and a in the end. Um, so I'm going to start by introducing Sara. Hi, Sara. Hi. <laughs> um, so Sara is um, a director at Social Keys and she's Health Optimization Summit Community Manager. So I believe that you must be blasted after the weekend. <laughs> so thank you so much for being here. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about your story into biohacking and the place you are now? Yeah, sure. Um, so for many years, um, I was depressed and anxious and I actually turned a lot into alcohol and cigarettes and just basically living the nightlife for a few years also. And after quite a few years with that, I then changed my life by one day I was like, I need to leave the medication behind. I need to find a different path uh, kind of way. But it wasn't all of a sudden. It was I started getting into listening to some podcasts about health. And then from there, I started listening about meditation. Um, I changed my diet. I started meditating, exercise. It was like a journey, each tool, each time, until slowly I started leaving my medication behind. Uh, and now, I, obviously, I had a few falls, like everyone in their journey. Uh, and I've been now medication-free completely for now like, two years now, uh, because I had a fall during the pandemic, which is obviously can happen to anyone. And I've been also alcohol free for like three years now, which a lot of people that used to know me are very surprised with that. Um, and yeah, I ended up building also a business that it was towards people that are also taking ownership of their health. That's not that's now my passion. Um, and yeah, I became a biohacker, community manager for the Health of Musician Summit, and look at me, now I'm here. <laughs> So now you're here. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and now Laura, Laura, Laura is the CEO of Monk, right? Yeah. Which is an app that we will listen about soon. To yeah. Be released. Yes. Do yeah, you want to tell us a little to... bit about that? Yeah, sure. So Monk is a holistic health tech startup, and we are launching the first at-home smart ice bath and cold water therapy app. Um, so as you can imagine, I'm a big fan of the cold. Um, it's one of the, the many kind of, you know, biohacks or, you know, kind of wellness hacks that, are, that I love. Um, and just to give you a really quick intro of how I got into biohacking, it's not the most exciting story. I feel like loads of people, you know, have had, they've got into it because, you know, they've had a condition that hasn't been, you know, treated by mainstream medical world. Mm -hmm. But for me, I don't know whether it's just like, the German efficiency in me or something like if I'm going to go from A to B I want to do it in like the most efficient way possible you and, have... and I just wanted to feel amazing you know sometimes like you wake up and you feel a bit foggy and I just thought like why why is that I just want to feel like 10 out of 10 every day um, and I think I I actually discovered bulletproof coffee and I tried it. And I was like, yeah, no, it's OK. And one of my friends just said, like, but you know, there's like there's more to it than the coffee. And then I just fell down the rabbit hole of, of biohacking. And yeah, here I am. 
Here you are. Yes. <laughs> so, so much topics there. Just, uh, but we are now moving to Marta and Christian will be the, do the uh, honors. Yes. Oh, so, uh, so Dr. Marta is here with us and uh, uh, yeah, I, I've had the pleasure of speaking her to her over many, many different topics and uh, she's got a wealth of knowledge in various and, and had a lot of experience in a number of different biotech uh, uh, companies and consulting along those things and, uh, and also in helping a lot of people and all of the companies in the sort of health organization biohacking spheres as well. So uh, I'll to leave it over to you, Marta, you tell your story best. Okay, thank you, Christian. It's been a pleasure, by the way, catching up with you over the weekend because it's it's been ages, yeah. Age, especially after the COVID. It's so nice to see everyone. Um, I'll keep it short. I guess the main thing is that I'm a GP by my background, a doctor that was never fine with just being a doctor. So I was always searching for something else, something else, something else. And I have two degrees, another degree is in international business. So I kind of feel that my passion and, and where I bring the best things is combining business and medicine. So bringing my business knowledge into commercial side, how do we, you know, optimize what we do. Um, so I'm working with them with a clinic in London as well. And uh, another clinic that I am practicing as a doctor is in Lithuania. It's my native Lithuania in Vilnius. Uh, so I see patients there, but in London, I do business development and partnerships with the private clinic, Human, uh, which is based in Chelsea. So I was super excited about the panel that we have today because I myself went through uh, such a huge, horrible burnout and uh, questioning everything, every possible thing in my life. And I thought if all of us can share at least a little bit of that and maybe, you know, say anything that would encourage some people, especially female, uh, that would be amazing. Because we all, all of the panelists are so incredible. I've met all of you in person and I'm so excited to be with you. <laughs> I think there's so much to, you know, to give. Thank you. Uh, yes, and uh, last but not least at all, uh, we have uh, Davinia Taylor here, and uh, who's, who's, who's a very interesting story as well. Uh, I mean, starting within the sort of media world and sort of TV actress and, and things like this, uh, going through her own health issues, and, uh, and then coming up the other side to write, write books, create resources to help people like herself and so people in similar situations have a better life. So again, you will tell your story better than I will ever do. Probably so you'll take it away. Well, I, I mean, as usual, it just most stories like begin with desperation, and I was desperately sick and tired. I'd given up alcohol. Um, I'm an alcoholic by nature, and that's always tapped me on the shoulder. So be care careful of like year five, Sarah. By the way, that 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 comes and bites you on the bum sometimes. I'd be very very careful of being happy. That's when alcohol is it, it works. So when I lost my mother. I obviously didn't turn to alcohol because I was on high guard, but I turned to the next best thing, which was, of course, carbohydrates. So I was chasing dopamine anyway, piled on loads of weight, went to my GP, said, look, I'm borderline obese. They told me to have a low fat diet, do calorie controlled. And then like you, Laura, kind of started looking at Dave Asprey business model. And then, then the cold started. And then all of a sudden I'm like, let's start stacking this shit, it works. You know, <laughs> I'm sat here with no acids because it's half term and the kids are coming home from school and I've got to protect myself. So it's like, you know, this is now just part of my everyday life and I'm excited by it. I wrote a number one bestseller, which is ridiculous because I used to fall asleep in English. And it went sometimes one, about biohacking you know there is a market there that that is just so big and I think people like Omnus you know they have an opportunity to literally get this to every normal man woman child and it's our right not to be bamboozled by people in white coats and you know what they say is true no let's learn our own biology and let's let's say what we need not what they need to sell us and I just think the phenomenal um, optimization summit this weekend just proved a point it was packed it was heaving everyone was excited to just feel 
better control and an option. If I want to feel up, what do I take? If I want to feel down, what do I take? If, you know, if I just want to zone out, what do I do? And like, we have the opportunity to hack into our mental health, hack into our gut, hack into our skin. And I just think it's a really exciting moment in time for all of us. And, you know, it's just about control as well. It's about feeling control about your own health and your own destiny. And I'm doing another book as well. That's that's out in April. And I'm really excited about that because, like I said, people just don't know. They're like, where do I start? And that, exactly. and I'm trying to trans. But I don't have a PhD, you know. I as soon as I start science exam, that was me and science done. And I try and translate it in a way that people like me get it and they can implement it. So what do I have for breakfast? How do I Wim Hof? When do I use the cold? When do I use heat? You know, just and as much of it can be free as possible. So I'm just trying to bring it to the masses and make it a bit entertaining, but you know, practical as well. Yeah. Yeah. So I think um, that I think one of the one of the sort of the huge topics in uh, sort of like female health, uh, it revolves a lot around things like menopause, especially it's a very uh, big topic that's going on right now. You know, with the you know, lack of HRT, especially in the particularly in the UK, and it having such a uh, huge effect in you know uh, on on women's health. Uh, so. Um, I, I think it'd be great to hear some of the some of the panel's opinions around, you know, the impact of uh, the impacts of menopause on their lives and or, or and whether it be the functional impacts that it's had or the work or the worries and concerns that it may have and also what how, what they think uh, uh, how they think they can combat that and how they have combated that uh, and in the past. Well. Um, I'd like to just say that I'm like hitting perimenopause and it, 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 it's pretty tough. But the last thing I want to do is just plaster over it with HRT, you know, mm. more root cause. It's obviously one of those I'm going to have to take a deep dive. And I'm doing lots of Dutch tests. I'm, you know, I'm doing as much due diligence as possible. But the last thing I want to do is check myself with patches all over me end up piling on a load of weight and compounding it even more I think once again we might be being just so we'll have HRT and carry on with your life and stop moaning there's more once again it's just not the root cause is it there's other issues at afoot you know that are triggering these awful reactions and this fear this suicidal feelings that we get I mean day two of my period it's it's like I've got postnatal depression again and then day four I'm out of it but a doctor will tell me I'm depressed. I'm like, how can it be depressed if it's, you know, happening once a month? You know, I don't get it. So again, yeah, I, 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 think we, I think we're putting everything onto HRT. And really there might be other solutions as well. Like what Laura's mentioning, the cold, you know, that's, that's never been suggested to me once about how, trying to right, right, rise up my by using the cold. Not once they'd say, you're mad. You'll end up with the yeah. flu. I, 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 I tend to... <laughs> I very much tend to agree around, you know, uh, over reliance on medication in general, but uh, particularly in the in, in, when it comes to hormones, whether it be male, female, anyone, I do always I do like to question why we why why someone wants to jump straight into that before trying to do something naturally. Um, I'd be really interested to hear Dr. Martin's opinion on this. Actually, I think there's, yes. there's probably some good crossover here before we before we move on. So on the hormones, right? Yeah, well, it's well and on menopause in general, but it's kind of on the same topic of HRT about, you know, when, why, where, you know, uh, what one of the things you can do if you don't want to go down that route. Honestly, I think it's it's a, such a good question and it's such a long question. I don't even know to be honest where to start, but what brings what it brings to mind is the patient that I recently had and she was um, in the perimenopause and you can just see that her hormones are going all over the place. You can just see it. It's hard to say, but once you talk to her, you can sense that something is wrong. And um, what happened actually, she would get panic attacks, meaning that her hormones were out of whack, like everything was happening. She was getting panic attacks, but she she would never have panic attacks before that. So you would 
think it's panic attack, but it's not really. It's just your hormones, you know, about to change. And um, she was a very, and she still is. Yeah. Oh, reading about it. Is that got something to do with the progesterone steel? As in, um, like progesterone just like gets wiped away because cortisol is the master hormone and that's what keeps you alive. Because I've just been reading about this. I'm like, oh my God, help me. Yeah. You know, <laughs> is, that what, is that what it's called? The progesterone steel or something? Just please clarify. It's so funny you say that because I, I suspect that might have been the case, actually. Because she was, uh, you know, you, you can you can't say what's happening with her, but that might have been the case because you can't test her at the same moment. As a doctor, I was like, okay, let's guess. Let's make our best guess what's happening with you right now. Um, and she she used to, you know, have lots of panic attacks recently, like in, in one month, two panic attacks, two emergency calls with a high blood pressure, with uh, absolutely not knowing what to do. And um, to be honest, I think there's a lot, a, a big emotional element to whatever this is, because if you can't be open with your emotions, this will aggravate these kind of things. Yes, on a hormonal way, it's already very difficult, but if on your emotional way, you don't have whom to talk with it about it, it's going to be even worse. So it took us about, you know, one, one hour to just talk about her life, nothing related to her hormones, to her life. And then I cracked the question. I said, do you think what happening with you is because of this, this, and that, and because you are here with your hormones and because your husband does not understand you and he he just he's pushing you you are very very vulnerable because of your hormones being out of whack and uh, your husband is not understanding and then where she burst into tears it, it was very 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 uh open moment it made me realize that as a doctors we also are a psychologist in a way and yes what davinia said yes but also as a human, uh, you just want someone to, to, to listen to you and um, understand you. And I think it's it's much bigger problem, actually, that women have. Mm. I love that you're bringing in the emotional side of it as well, because I think there's it has such a huge impact on us. And even things like, you know, I'm not going to get too woo woo, but like past traumas and stuff that we just don't think of. It's not just what's happening in our body biochemically um and also i'm so i'm not approaching menopause yet hopefully <laughs> i don't even know how i'm going to handle that but i'm having enough trouble anyway just with like periods and you, my usual cycle like just to give you a quick overview i've had trouble with my skin for honestly like years now it just exploded once and i um was just told like oh it's your liver it's this it's that and you know you have to try out whatever supplements or routine for kind of like four to six months and still nothing was happening and I think it was actually my herbalist once he just looked at me and was like estrogen dominance and I was like do I do a test and he was like don't you, you don't need to do a test you can if you want and obviously I did <laughs> and actually I did it at human um and it's a similar you know that the Dutch test with the hormone panel that the omnos do and yeah my estrogen was sky high about demon calcium great and did that help yeah I took a whole host of um supplements which really helped and it turned out it was my my phase two detox which was really sluggish but I'm still not there like my skin is still not great um but I think a lot of that is also stress unfortunately I live that kind of stressful life trying to balance like a career and just you know uh, yeah, I, I, happy. <laughs> yes Laura so you just mentioned it's stress and, and the culture of burnout among entrepreneurs. Um, how do you handle that? How do you handle your career and your personal life so you can kind of keep the balance and not lose track? Um, I try to handle it. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, I rephrase. Yeah. How do you try to handle it? So, I, I mean, I definitely do rely on some sort of tech. Like, I love, I have, you know, an Apollo, which is supposed to be really good for increasing oh, HRV, reducing stress. Yes. Yeah, I love that. Me too. You, uh, yes. Okay. 
yeah, that's that has been phenomenal. Um, but also just trying to even be really segmented with, you know, I don't work after X time or at least have like, you know, take proper weekends off and you know how whenever I like train and so on I try and schedule those things in my diary and just try to not let them slip um because unfortunately you know my life is really busy and although it's it's fine to put like these kind of boundaries in of course there's always going to be times when work is just too much like leading up to the summit for example which we were all at is just a crazy stressful time so yeah I guess trying to just balance lifestyle making sure I'm always eating well um you know I've got my nutrition on points and yeah sauna the cold whatever it is that that i need to try and stay semi-sane <laughs> to be the one thing that sort of like levels me out and brings my stress levels down i mean i'm not talking ultras i'm talking like a 7k slow run to a little bit of old house music that seems mm. to be my fast track to de-stress that and sauna actually that's that mm. that and like a little mm -hmm. No, something. Sorry. Some, sorry. <laughs> you know something actually that a lot of people might find it a bit weird is I actually have to include sometimes Netflix nights on my schedule because otherwise I don't have some time for myself and my boyfriend. <laughs> yeah. Because I just yes. I'm always working, always looking at computers on my phone and everything, trying to work. And when I actually started seeing him, obviously he's a Netflix fan. And I was just like, how can you just sit down in a couch and watch Netflix? But I started doing that. And I was just like, actually, this is very beneficial for me sometimes. Mm -hmm. It really calms me down. And I feel like I'm more productive the next day if I just relax a bit the day before. Although obviously watching Breaking Bad might not be like the most like chilled <laughs> program. Just but it quarters all fire yeah, yeah, from but your just rain. Like chilling next to him, uh even like a keto ice cream. And yeah, it's just sometimes it's what I need. And then obviously I do the meditation before going to bed, which obviously that helps a lot. I, I was oh sorry Christian. Go ahead. I was gonna say I was gonna say like you know uh you know a few of you know know what my mind is like you know and it's like it, it's the you when you when you're active and you're on point so often sometimes you just need an off switch and you know and spending time with people that you you like and love in many cases as well you know that is in itself a biohack no you know uh, you know hug, hugging someone you love you know being around people that you you care about that in itself has its own, uh, own beneficial aspect yes but i would like to add something to that because it's also a culture of being very productive right very efficient and sometimes we, we just can't live up to that so i would like to ask our guests uh what are the bare minimals that you uh, make sure to follow when life gets chaotic or hectic as i believe your weekend was what is why are the things that you won't let go like your main main um uh, base basics for health besides uh, netflix <laughs> yeah sh should i get started i think my minimum usually no matter what is at least hit the gym one or twice to put that frustration on weights okay <laughs> then another one would be definitely like the meditation i think meditation definitely completely changed my life having like those 10 minutes a day that no matter what i am sitting down and i'm just like listening to the empty sound actually there's nothing happening usually in my apartment it's like it's very quiet uh especially if my partner is sleeping and it's just amazing how like the chaotic day can be and then i arrive at those 10 minutes and all of a sudden everything that was chaotic during the day just doesn't matter anymore because there's like that silence and all everything is just it's just tangible it's just so much easier i'm down to earth um, another thing that I love to do is every week I, I usually um, drive to a farm near my house, which is like five minutes from my house, and I see the little lambs <laughs> uh, running around before I buy the meat at the farm, actually, which some people find it a bit weird that I see the lambs and the piglets running before I buy the meat. But there's something about it, something about like feeling the nature, feeling that I am part of something. I'm part also of of the farm itself because I know the people in there I know I see the animals I see everything that just makes me so relaxed um I was sick for two weeks and I didn't go to the farm 
to buy my meat. Uh, my boyfriend went to buy the meat. And when I returned, I just like, I was like, oh my God, I really miss this. Looking at the sunlight above the farm and just seeing the animals running around. It's just, it's just amazing. It just really makes me chilled. I think those are definitely my main minimums. Um, obviously there's other things usually on the other, when I have more time. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you often use any tech devices uh, to help you? Um, yeah, so especially if it comes to tracking my health and my anxiety, for example, uh, I used to use a lot of a spreadsheet, for example, for that, which is not very great. Uh, and, and I have like folders also on my, on my computer where I have like documents in there about like all the tracking of my health. So um, on my daily basis, sometimes I, I go into those and if I feel something different, I go and check and I'm like, does it make sense with with the data that I have at the moment. So that helps a bit, obviously, uh, tracking things. Uh, I usually use the app Calm also to meditate every day. So that helps a lot also. The Aura Ring score, which I try to not be dependent on that, but it's kind of like, in, like I look at it as like a 90. Oh, that was a good night. Was it really? Uh, I can't be dependent on that. <laughs> um, yeah, I think those are the a few of the ones of the red light therapy also, if it's very rainy, especially in UK, uh, doing the meditation sometimes in front of it. There's something about it that it just lights me up inside also, not only the outside. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Anyone else would like to share? I'd love to know about Laura's um, ice bath. Ooh, okay. Um, so it's the uh, it's the first smart ice bath, <laughs> oh. um, and it's you know it's got all the stuff that we would love like ozone filtration. So you only have to actually change the water every like six months. Um, yeah, it's got all the smart functionality like changing the temperature and controlling it on your phone and stuff. But what I think is super cool about it is that the software we're building. It actually gives you a personalized program, like depending on why you're using it, you know, if it's for neuroprotection or mental health or muscle recovery, you'd use it in quite a different way. And then it brings in that, um, you know, kind of like guided therapy and meditation stuff over the top. And it's so interesting. I was talking to one of my friends. He bought um, someone else's ice bath and he could only stay in it for 40 seconds. And so I guided him. I was like, OK, like, listen to this track, skip this far in, like do this. And the next day he was like. I just stayed in for two minutes and then like two weeks later he's up to six but it's one of those things like you know in the cold it just it makes you so present so then you can listen to the meditation and the meditation keeps you in the cold so it's this really nice kind of like self virtuous cycle but yeah but in short sorry it's coming later this year keep you posted I mean I'd be so interested to uh, check it out it sounds yeah. like it sounds funny because you know, I, th I think we do need guidance and we do need parameters yeah. rules. Otherwise, we generally go off on a tangent and make our own rules up. And before you know it, you're doing it completely wrong. And it turns out you're having a nice warm shower. You're like, hey. <laughs> yeah. Next thing you're in the sauna. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that sounds um, fantastic. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I'll keep you, keep you in the loop. Um, a couple of things that, that also really helped me is I love to journal, which I only started. I don't know, maybe like nine months. And apart from the last two weeks, I do it probably not maybe every day, but maybe every other day. And that I found has been phenomenal. Um, and also breath work is a really big one for me. Um, there's a guy I really like called Breathe With James. Um, I think it's like 15 pounds a month and he's kind of categorized it. There's like breath work for the morning, for sleep, for anxiety. And so you can kind of just dip in and out whenever you like. And I find that just helps me kind of stay yeah, just, I don't know, just slightly more calm. Well, it's breathing, I was, yeah. Breathing, isn't it? You know, if you think about how long we can go without water, how long we can go without food, but, you know, mm. eh, not that long, really. Yeah, so, true. Oh, so automated, but once you start hacking into it and really breathing, you can totally change the level of that serotonin. I've mm. definitely tea or something's gone wrong or I'm in grief or something like that I think it was last Christmas I was having a really tough time custody battles and everything mm -hmm. and I did I did I actually half just old school whim half and I, I literally felt a lift in serotonin in my brain between coming down from the bedroom down the stairs to see the children my mood had changed and I'd gone into Christmas mum as opposed to 
Scrooge. So that helped. You know. Sorry, um, Devine, did you say that you used Wim Hof? Um, I, I didn't do, I didn't use the cold. I just happened to have his app. I just thought I've got nothing else in my artillery right now. I've got screaming kids downstairs. I've not wrapped the presents. The dogs have got out. Uh, it's raining, it's muddy, it's horrible. Christmas is crap, it's expensive. And all this was going on. I just thought, let's listen to Crazy Dutch Guy. Let's do it. And I just <laughs> No, well, we're talking three minute breath holds, but it changed. And I literally could feel the serotonin move. <clears throat> Whatever hormone it was, maybe it was that progesterone or something. I don't know. Can something. we ask Marta? Yeah. Much yeah. faster. Yes. Much faster. Sorry, it's the connection. I really have some trouble. Marta, your vision, Dr. Marta, your vision as a physician uh, on this breathing and um, how this is a tool that we have on hand, on hands uh, at every moment, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think we're talking about what what do we do when we lose it all and when we just like nothing works, what are the tools that we go to? Yeah. And I think breathing is, well, I'll be really honest, breathing is something that I'm still working on. I think it's great, but I don't think I personally have the best uh, advantage of it. Because I know, especially Laura, I have no, you know, no doubt she she knows what it means <laughs> to to do it and then plunge in a super cold bath. I am on, you know, I'm getting there, okay. so I wouldn't be the best person to say. I think Laura would, but uh, if we say uh, if we talk about, okay, Marta, what do you do when nothing else works? When um, you feel absolutely down? When nothing everything is horrible you wake up and you think this is nonsense this life is nonsense i don't like what i do i don't like anything okay what what is the step by step you would say you do because i went from major major burnout and i had to learn to get myself back into the normal or into the functional self of mine because otherwise you 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 feel like you can't do anything so i think when when you are feeling overwhelmed first of all just do nothing learn to do nothing don't stress about it and own it own it because you think that lots of things are stressing me out lots of people are stressing me out no own it you actually let them stress you out you let these things to stress you out so that's, I think it's a major um, psychological shift that you have to understand. It's, it's up to you. You are queen of your life. And if you let someone stress you out, it's just up to you. It's not up to them. And um, I was just saying, I know we spoke about this before. And it's like when you're going through those processes of being stressed out, you know, what we naturally do is tend, tend to reach out to certain things especially, you know, if, if we're preconditioned to any particular addictive behaviors and aspects like this. So I think it'd be really good to actually just branch into that conversation a little bit, talking about, you know, mm. how to sort of flip those things around into our own, our own positives, our own benefits as well. Yeah, it's actually a very good point, Christian, because we, we did indeed talk about it. And we said that this is where addictions come from. Mm -hmm. It's so easy to be addicted to anything because, you know, when you're feeling super low, you, you're you just craving for something like, I just wish for something to make me feel a bit better right now because I have my meetings coming up during the day. I have my work. I have my da da da. And you're just clinging to something. I need something because there's nothing from me. And there were, uh, that's where addictions come from. And unfortunately, some addictions are alcohol. Some addictions are even work overworking it's also an addiction sport as well i've seen people that are harming themselves with sport and yes they do um reach a lot but they actually are harming themselves even more so i would say what are you running from is the main question and how do you make your life the, the way that you don't want to run away from that life anymore just keep working on the life you want and um, 
Yeah, addiction is a big thing. As a doctor, I see a lot of patients that are addicted, unfortunately. I think it's an, um, I think it's bigger than the pandemic. I think we are addicted to junk food, like veg oil, sugar, obviously. Yes. That combination of junk food, alcohol, easy access, recreational drugs, the phone, work, like you said. But it's all dopamine driven. I think we are all so low on dopamine we have such a low dopamine level that we're always trying to lift it always trying to lift it and then when it drops yeah. down that pain that pain is unbearable i can still remember my last drink and it was uh, the, the the actual physical withdrawal and the nightmare the eternal fear of you are you you you're, you're trapped in a hell that you will never escape time extended it was I would have killed for a bottle of wine, you know, killed someone for a bottle of wine and, you know, tried, I've tried to kill myself for it, you know, and it's, it's that powerful. You don't, you're not addicted for fun. It's, it's not, I just think it's just to feel normal. And I think we live in such an artificial world that our children are growing up with high stimulation all the time. They're just becoming dopamine flatline. There's, there's no boredom. There's no boredom to replenish and bring up the, the, the nice level again. There's, like you said, nature and stuff makes you feel better. But I think we've, we are dopamine nation. That book is just right. And that's, that, that's what we are creating monsters, Be, not monsters as the person, just as in facing that tiny high just to get through a Monday morning. You know, it's phenomenally painful addiction, phenomenally painful. 100%. And I've seen those patients that would want to kill for, for a bottle of wine or whatever. I've seen it. it it's real. And how do we even uh, allow ourselves to go there? But it's just, on the other hand, it's so easy to go there within, you know, our normal life right now. It's just so easy to get addicted to anything at the moment. And me as a doctor, I'm actually I'm terrified because I'm just trying to find ways how to help these people because I know that's so hard that sometimes I don't know how to help them. Sometimes an open conversation and almost like crying together on the session. That's all <laughs> I can do. I don't know what else. You know? I to that group as well as everything else. Oh my God. I'll yeah. go to AIDS. Yeah. Oh um, I God. think. I think it's also scary to think that some people are addicted to these things, but they don't see it because they don't know what it is to not be addicted to those things. I'm yeah. going to give an example. I used to absolutely love Big Macs. And I remember the last time I ate a Big Mac and I felt so awful. I was just like, because I was already a biohacker. So I was already avoiding those nasty foods. I was already avoiding cigarettes and and alcohol, etc. So I had a Big Mac and I was like, one last one, just like old times. And I had it and I felt so awful afterwards that I was like, how did I used to eat these so many times? And I thought it was normal to feel that way and it wasn't. But how do you know that when is addiction and what is not? Because even, for example, when it comes to biohacking and work, I can see myself sometimes very much into uh, I want to do a bit more. I want to do a bit more. I want to just find out something more. And it can be a bit addictive also. So I need to always bring myself back into, okay, is this actually now becoming a bit more harmful? I need to give time to myself. And those are very important steps also in our journey is to see where is it actually that we're doing too much of something that actually might be harmful for us. I think um, that brings up some really, really interesting like, sort of segue and something else I thought would be interesting to talk about. And one of those things is, you know, how we make how we make addictions almost positive for ourselves, like how we can turn addictive tendencies into something that's really powerful for us. But like Marta said, you know, you can be addicted to sport, it can be doing you more harm than good. So then there's that also the, the other aspect of like to be ready to do nothing. And how do we create that balance between positive addiction and you know, room, uh, and uh, main, maintaining a normal stress and like work-life balance, right? And, and uh, how do we how do we work, map that in? And I know something you, you've been talking about before, Sarah, as well, is, you know, the different timing schedules, the difference between how a woman might do that versus a man might do that. So I think, you know, it might be good to sort of like uh, explore that a little bit more. That's a good point. 
to make your <laughs> bad addictions into something good, you know, because <laughs> I've seen so many bad addictions. I'm thinking, why can't we just be addicted to a good health, you know, <laughs> improving our health? I want to be addicted to that. Um, technically, I'm, I'm thinking like I used to be addicted to go out every night and get drunk and smoking <laughs> and just partying. I used to be addicted to that. And then when I changed my life, I felt a few times that I was actually uh, turning that addiction a bit into work and biohacking. And that's where a few points, like for example, the Health of the Nutrition Summit can be very intensive. Um, and I think it's where it's important also for me to add those minimums. So there's those pockets of time that I add every week or every weekend also that I know it's gonna be for myself and it's gonna bring me back to, to just spend time to myself and some quality self-care actually, uh, which I always see as a buzzword, but it is needed for someone that can be addictive to something good like, like biohacking and, and work. It's not exactly good, but it has obviously, it's better than alcohol. Um, so yeah. I yeah. think it's tricky ones as, as well. You, you may know I've got four boys. So as soon as I finish work, which I don't because I'm selling online constantly on Instagram with, so with my company, Will Powders, also writing a book, also four children whose washing load is ridiculous. I'm just like, it is relentless. It, it, it's nonstop. And I, I, I know I'm heading for burnout. I know I am. But what do I do? I've got school fees to pay. I've got mouths to feed. I've got, a, I've got people to pay. And it's like, this is the 21st century. That's why I'm hooked up to this bloody thing. Because, you know, I, I have four children to look after and there is no time for self-care. Maybe a little bit of Netflix when they go to bed between after nine o'clock. One of them will get into bed crying with a nightmare so my sleep's disturbed. I mean, the reality of when you're a mum, when you're a CEO and when you're just generally just, just trying to live life, I don't think we have any balance really. And so that's why I think biohacking is so important that I do, after this, I'm having NAD and I am just smashing it. And, I, and then that will bring me back up again because I've got to, I've got, I've got no opportunity. I can't say, guys, listen, I'm taking 24 hours for myself and you just cook your own breakfast. Not going to happen. Wash your own. They're only, what, the youngest is six, the eldest is 14. Can you imagine the chaos? <laughs> <laughs> not happening um so well as soon as you're a mom forget about that self-care honestly it just goes out the window because you are way down the pecking order like it, it's, it's it's um it's mitigation isn't it you know it's like you know it's figuring out what what you can do to mitigate your own personal circumstance so whether whether it's uh, a drip whether it's uh a netflix whether it's a, a, a cold uh, a, a cold bath or or breathing or a sauna or whatever we choose to do quick yeah that's because seconds got seconds for self-care not hours you know and we'll go for a walk but one of them will end up punching the other one and the dog will get away and you know it just night i'll be honest so you know. i would like just to, to point out what dr marta said uh, i really resonate to that that when we are burned out we need to learn how to do nothing um, and i don't think that is easy at all like when I have nothing to do, time for myself, I'm like, oh, should be doing this and taking care of the kid and just running and I'm planning ahead. What, what's next? What's next? What's next? So we kind of live in this culture that pushes us forward, right? And, and as a woman, we need to be good moms and good CEOs and good entrepreneurs and all of that, this culture of burnout constantly. Um, so when you said learn to do nothing, uh, would you care to elaborate a little bit for the ones that I would just might be hitting a burnout well i i was uh, having my uh, burnout uh like a, it started half a year ago and i think only now i'm slowly coming back so there are many tips i can give uh, but one of the things of feeling nothing is learn to i don't know how it's gonna sound but in a way that worked for me so maybe if i share it this might be useful for someone is uh, learn to create your own avatar and detach yourself like 
you wake up in the morning, you feel absolutely crap. You don't want to do anything, but then say, okay, this is not even me. That body that goes and does all of this thing that I need to do is my avatar. Imagine your avatar being, I want to be successful. I want to be you know, strong, healthy. I want to bring love to people, ta -da -da, whatever you want to, to be. Imagine and just show up like that avatar and detach and say, okay, today I feel crap, but my avatar can still do it. And um, I know it sounds maybe weird and it's, it's a big detachment and you obviously have to know what you feel, but I think at the same time, you, you have to know what you feel, but then you still want to live life. And uh, I, I really like that um, sort of example of an avatar, just create of your visual that you want to be and present yourself as that for today. But in the background, you're probably crap and you're probably very tired and you probably don't want to do anything. And it's fine. It is okay, right? It is okay for yeah, people go for to it. feel that. Yes. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. It's totally fine to feel like that, but you don't want to lose a day. You know, you don't want to lose your meetings. You don't want to lose your opportunities. So just create an avatar and play a game and in a way it's almost like fake it till you make it mm -hmm. and very often it actually was a best choice for me to be honest because I would catch up with that avatar in the end of the day I would start the day where my avatar is here I'm is I'm way below there but in the end of the day I'm almost like yeah I can feel it yeah oh, if you thanks. know what I mean like fake it till you make it sometimes really works from the health perspective from the mind perspective it's been some great, great topics today, but I think, you know, we, we are getting to a point where we're going to start wrapping up. So I know there's at least one question in the chat box. I think, uh, Katrina, there was a, a pre-webinar pre question that we were sent over to ask as well. So I think maybe if we start just doing a bit of Q&A just to wrap up before, um, before we say goodbye. Yes. So I have three questions here and, oh, and a new one just popped in. Okay, so whoever wants to answer, okay, it's not for anyone in particular. So according to you, is there enough education on female health, especially around fertility and menopause? Um, I'm there because I had IVF and I think that was a, after I had number one, I, I number my children, uh, I had postnatal depression. Not once was my uh, hormone levels tested. I was put on bipolar medication and antidepressants, like massive. I turned to alcohol. So that's the only thing that boosted my mood. And yeah, it was definitely child taken off me. Not once did the IVF say, hang on, I think we might have an estrogen problem here. Not once. I had to fight for five years to get my kid back. So no, I don't think there is enough at all. And the dangers, and the post care, they said, about, there's your baby, go and be happy. I was terrified. And not, not baby blues. And then I couldn't breastfeed because I had uh, DMER, which is like a feeling, a huge drop in dopamine. Like, it's like um, or your soul being sucked out of you. Not once was I told that was a drop in dopamine. So again, not one hormone was ever mentioned to me. I was just told I was bipolar and just to you know go and fight go and fight for custody and that took five years of my child's life and i'm not messing come on is that normal in the 21st century after <laughs> you know so no i don't think there's enough people speaking about it nor the correlation so, or nor the correlations about it, uh, of hormones and post-birth and ivf there, there isn't the warnings aren't there nor the aftercare at all and i mean not to do a dutch test after i'd just given birth and i was suicidal I mean, it's bonkers. Bonkers. Right. We live and learn. So, also for the four of you, uh, so do you wish that home testing should have been around earlier? And do you wish that you knew that all this health hack way sooner in your lives? I personally do. Um, even, you know, I mentioned earlier my skin issues. It started when I was in my early 20s and I didn't know there was, you know, I could have gone to someone that wasn't my doctor. I had no clue that there was anything different outside of that. 
Um, and I went through all like the usual things, put me on so many antibiotics, eventually put me on uh, Roaccutane, which I think is a really hideous drug. And if I had known what I, I know now about it, I would never have touched it or gone near it. Um, so yeah, absolutely. I wish I, wish I knew a, a lot more sooner for sure. Yeah, I have something to say also when it comes to uh, antidepressants and benzos, which I was like for seven or eight years. And when I decided to go more into finding out how to get off these, one of the things that passed through my mind many times was I don't want to be on antidepressants and have a baby. That's That was one of the biggest things also that made me think was like, I need to come off of these to one day have a baby because I don't know the consequences of it, although they say it can be safe, but you don't know long term the consequences of it. And I wish that someone would have told me something like eat better, take care of your sleep, exercise before anyone who have given me benzos and antidepressants for so many years that I think actually sent me on a spiral to to alcohol and and the addictions that obviously they weren't very healthy. So yeah, I wish there was more information about it, definitely. We've got a question there directly for Marta. Um, is it, in your opinion, how does the promotion of longevity differ if it is done by men for men compared to how it is done by women for women? Well, that's a, that's a pretty tricky uh, question, but though it's a good one though. Uh, by the way, just, um, going back to all of the free answers from Davinia, Laura and Sarah about what they uh, would have loved to know earlier rather than later. I'm just so on the same page with them because uh, I know I've heard Davinia's story from, from you, Davinia, uh, personally, and I was fascinated, like how, what strength does it need to take to actually, you know, overcome that and, and do the things you do now. And so that's, incredibly amazing and that's I'm not sure I could do it and you know the, the things that Laura came through the Sarah as well like benzos also I was uh, you know one of the things I did have an addiction less of an addiction but in any case it's still an addiction from a sleeping pills where my sleep was horrible and so you can't imagine your life without that nice sleeping pill in the end of the day so i totally get that part and um i do feel that women and men get it a bit differently and women face way different problems as well and uh before this this panel i was actually looking at the stats and uh, what what's happening there what um what women are saying about their health is do their needs are being met or not and so four out of five women and uh say that you know when they go to their gps they don't feel like they're being listened to. They don't think that their problems are being addressed to. They don't feel like they are, have a freedom to ask questions. So the thing is that, yes, I, I think when healthcare is um, built by women, we understand the problems way better. If it's, but mostly, you know, most of CEOs, uh, I don't know, 78%, I think of a tech um, CEOs are men right now. So this is to be changed. And yes, I do think that gender differences are there and uh, women problems, women issues are not being addressed enough. If, if that answers the question. Yeah, I, I, think so. yeah. that was, I think one of the, one of the biggest points of that question and also what you just said there is you know, because of the, the difference in representation, all the time the research just hasn't been done therefore to answer that it's like well you know we can't because we just don't know yes no one's looked you know and there, there's definitely a difference but you know we don't really have the evidence to say what that difference is you know not 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 in a, a really objective way everything it feels still a little bit anecdotal and subjective when it comes to answering things like that at the moment which i think is a, is a huge problem you know 100 percent you know, I still laugh about this uh, expression. Oh, you have to man up. Like, why don't you <laughs> man up? <laughs> why is it man up? You have to woman up, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, Honestly, it's fun, but it's just uh, it's in our culture. Yes. That's where these expressions come from. So there's a lot of work to do. Yeah, no, I agree. And yes. I, I do think we have to stop to wrap it up there. I think Katrina, right? Yes, we just hit the benchmark. Yeah. It was lovely to have you here. Thank you so much. Um, I just would like to tell <clears throat> the attendees that you will receive a, a small survey if you would like to help us. Um, giving you what you want to hear. Academy is just starting, so we're very, very interested in your opinion uh, and subjects that you would like to see here. There's this four amazing women. Um, oh, when you message, say goodbye. Where can we find the recording? You will receive the recording because you're registered. So tomorrow it will be in your mobile box. So Christian, anything else? No, I think uh, that's it for me. Uh, we had also had uh, one person stating that uh, they were saying thank you to Martin for the avatar analogy uh, as well, just to make sure that's, that goes on. But, uh, oh, yeah, yes, exactly. I didn't see it. Yes. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, thank you all so much for taking your time out to, to, to come onto this panel and discuss these topics with us. Uh, super insightful, super useful information. I think uh, everyone in the audience would agree that. Uh, this is a very, very interesting conversation. Super interesting to be repeated probably uh, later on. So thank you so much. Have a good day and see you soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.